Chapter 12, Ambassador to the Enemy Clip, clop, clip, sounded Betsy's hoofs across the field. There's a treacherous slime of mud in the surface, but underneath it the clouds were still frozen as hard as iron. Then the bare branches of the woods were all around them, and Caddy had to duck and dodge to save her eyes and her hair. Here the February thaw had not succeeded in clearing the snow. It stretched gray and dreary underfoot, treacherously rotted about the roofs of the roots of the big trees. Caddy slowed her mare's pace and guided her carefully now. She did not want to lose precious time in floundering about in melting snow. Straight for the river she went. The ice still held, she could get across here, and the going would be easier on the other side. Not a squirrel or a burr stirred in the woods. So silent, so silent. Only the clip-clop-clip clip of Betsy's hoofs. Then the river stretched out before her, a long expanse of blue-gray ice under the gray sky. Carefully now, Betsy, take it slowly, old girl. Caddy held a tight rein with one hand and stroked the horse's neck with the other. That's a good girl. Take it slowly. Down the bank they went, delicately onto the ice. Betsy flung up her head, her nostrils distended. Her hind legs slipped on the ice, and for a quivering instant she struggled for her balance. Then she found her pace. Slowly, cautiously, she went daintily forward, picking her way, but with a snort of disapproval for the wisdom of her young mistress. The ice creaked, but it was still sound enough to bear their weight. They reached to the other side and scrambled up the bank. Well, so much done. Now for more woods. There was no proper sunset that day, only a sudden lemon-colored rift in the clouds in the west. Then the clouds closed together again and darkness began to fall. The ride was long, but at last it was over. Blue with cold, Caddy rode into the clearing where the Indians had built their winter huts. Dogs ran at her, barking, and there was a warm smell of smoke in the air. A fire was blazing in the center of the clearing. Dark figures moved about it. Were they in war-painted feathers? Hattie's heart pounded as she drew Pet Betsy to a stop. But no, surely they were only old women bending over cooking pots. The running figures were children coming now to swarm about her. There was no war-paint, no feathers. Surely she and father had been right. Tears began to trickle down Caddy's cold cheeks. Now the men were coming out of their bark huts. More and more Indians kept coming toward her, but they were not angry, only full of wonder. John, said Caddy in a strange little voice, which he hardly recognized as hers. Where is John? I must see John. John, repeated the Indians, recognizing the name the white men had given to one of their braves. They spoke with strange sounds among themselves, then one of them went running. Caddy sat on her horse half dazed, cold to the bone, but happy inside. The Indians were not on the warpath, they were not preparing an attack. Whatever the tribes farther west might be plotting, these Indians, whom father and she trusted, were going about their business peacefully. If they could only get away now in time before the white men came to kill them, or perhaps she could get home again in time to stop the white men from making the attack. Would those men whom she had heard talking by the cellar door believe a little girl when she told them that Indians John, Indian John's tribe was at peace? She did not know. Savages were savages, but what could one expect of civilized men who plotted massacre? Indian John's tall figure came toward her from one of the huts. His step was unhurried and his eyes were unsurprised. You lost, Missy Redhair? he inquired. No, no, said Caddy. I am not lost, John, but I must tell you. Some white men are coming to kill you. You and your people must go away. You must not fight. You must go away. I have told you. You cold, said John. He lifted Caddy off her horse and led her to the fire. No, understand, said John, taking, shaking his head in perplexity. Speak too quick, Missy Redhair. Caddy tried again, speaking more slowly. I came to tell you. Some bad men wish to kill you and your people. You must go away, John. My father is your friend. I came to warn you. Redbeard, he sent? asked John. No, my father did not send me, said Caddy. No one knows that I have come. You must take your people and go away. You hungry? John asked her, and mutely Caddy nodded her head. Tears were running again and her teeth were chattering. John spoke to the squaws, standing motionless about the fire. Instantly they moved to do his bidding. One spread a buffalo skin for her to sit on. Another ladled something hot and tasty into a cup without a handle, a cup which had doubtless come from some settler's cabin. Caddy grasped the hot cup between her cold hands and drank. 
little trickle of warmth seemed to, to go all over her body. She stretched her hands to the fire. Her tears stopped running and her teeth stopped chattering. She let the Indian children, who had come up behind her, touch her hair without flicking it away from them. John's dog came and lay down her, near her, wagging his tail. You tell John again, said John, squatting beside her in the firelight. Caddy began again, slowly. She told how the whites had heard that the Indians were coming to kill. She told how her father and she had not believed. She told how some of the people had become restless and planned to attack the Indians first. She begged John to go away with his tribe while there was still time. When she had finished, John grunted and continued to sit on, looking into the fire. She did not know whether he had yet understood her. All about the fire were row and row and dark faces, looking at her steadily with wonder but no understanding. John knew more English than any of them, and yet, it seemed, he did not understand. Patiently, she began again to explain, but now John shook his head. He rose and stood tall in the firelight above the little white girl. You come, he said. Caddy rose uncertainly. She saw that it was quite dark now outside the ring of firelight, and a fine, sharp sleet was hissing down into the fire. John spoke in his own tongue to the Indians. What he was telling them she could not say, but their faces did not change. One ran to lead Betsy to the fire, and another brought a spotted Indian pony that had been tethered at the edge of the clearing. Now we go, said the Indian. I will go back alone, said Caddy, speaking distinctly. You and your people must make ready to travel westward. Red hair has spoken, said John. John's people go tomorrow. He lifted her onto her horse's back and himself sprang onto the pony. Caddy was frightened again, frightened of the dark and cold, and uncertain of what John meant to do. I can go alone, John, she said. John go too, said the Indian. He turned his pony into the faint woods trail by which he had come. Betsy, her head drooping under a slack rein, followed the spotted pony among the dark trees. Farther and farther behind, they left the warm, bright glow of the fire. Looking back, Caddy saw it twinkling like a bright star. It was something warm and friendly in a world of darkness and sleet and sudden icy branches. From the bright star of the Indian fire, Caddy's mind leaped forward to the bright warmth of home. They would have missed her by now. Would Katie tell where she had gone? Would they be able to understand why she had done as she had? She bent forward against Betsy's neck, hiding her face from the sharp needles of sleet. It seemed a very long way back, but at last the branches no longer caught at her skirts. Caddy raised her head and saw that they had come out on the open river bank. She urged Betsy forward beside the Indian pony. John, you must go back now. I can find my way home. They would kill you if they saw you. John only grunted. He sent his moccasined heels into the pony's flanks and led the way onto the ice. Betsy shook herself with a kind of shiver all through her body, as if she were saying, no, no, no. But Caddy's stiff fingers pulled the rein tight and made her go. The wind came down the bare sweep of the river with tremendous force, cutting and lashing them with the sleet. Betsy slipped and went to her knees, but she was up again at once and on her way across the ice. Caddy had lost the feeling of her own discomfort and fear for John. If a white man saw him riding toward the farm at night, he would probably shoot without a moment's warning. Did John understand that? Was it courage or ignorance that kept John's figure so straight, riding erect in the blowing weather? John, she cried. But the wind carried her voice away. John! But he did not turn his head. Up the bank, through the woods, to the edge of the clearing, they rode, Indian file. Then the po Indian pony stopped. Caddy drew Betsy in beside him. Thank you, she panted. Thank you, John, for bringing me home. Go now, go quickly. Her frightened eyes swept the farmstead. It was not dark and silent as it had been the night before. Lanterns were flashing here and there. People were moving about. Voices were calling. They're starting out after the Indians, thought Caddy. Father hasn't been able to stop them. They're going to massacre. She laid her cold hand on the spotted pony's neck. John, she cried. John, you must go quickly now. John, go, said the Indian, turning his horse. But before the Indian could turn back into the woods, a man had sprung out of the darkness and caught his bridle rein. Stop. Who are you? Where are you going? The words snapped out like the cracking of wet, but Caddy knew the voice. Father, she cried. Father, it's me, Caddy. You, Caddy? Thank goodness. His voice was full of warm relief. Hey, Robert, bring the lantern. We found her. Caddy, my little girl. Suddenly, Father was holding her close in his arms, 
His beard prickling her cheek, and over his shoulder she could see Robert Ireton with a bobbing lantern that threw odd, that threw odd shafts of moving light among the trees. John, too, had dismounted from his pony and stood straight and still, his arms folded across his chest. Oh, father, cried Caddy, remembering again her mission in the last uncomfortable hours. Father, don't let them kill John. Don't let them do anything bad to the Indians. The Indians are our friends, father. Truly they are. I've been to the camp and seen them. They mean us no harm. You went to the Indian camp, Caroline? Yes, father. That was a dangerous thing to do, my child. Yes, father. But Kent and some of the men meant to go and kill them. I heard them say so. They said they wouldn't tell you they were going, and you weren't there. Oh, father, what else could I do? He was silent for a moment, and Caddy stood beside him, shivering and oppressed by the weight of his disapproval. In the swaying lantern light, she searched the faces of the three men. Robert's honest mouth and open in astonishment. Father's brows knit in thought. John's dark face impassive and remote, with no one knew what thoughts passing behind it. Caddy could bear the silence no longer. Father, the Indians are our friends, she repeated. Is this true, John? asked Father. Yes, true, Redbeard, answered John gravely. My people fear yours, John. Many times I have told them that you are our friends. They do not always believe. My people foolish sometime, too, said John. Not now. They no kill white. Redbeard is my friend. He brought me home, father, said Caddy. You must not let them kill him. No, no, Caddy. There shall be no killing tonight, nor any more, I hope, forever. Over her head, the white man and the red man clasped hands. I keep the peace, John, said father. The white men shall be your brothers. Redbeard has spoken. John's people keep the peace. For a moment they stood silent, their hands clasped in the clasp of friendship, their heads held high like two proud chieftains. Then John turned to his pony. He gathered the slack reins, sprang on the pony's back, and rode away in the darkness. Oh, my little girl, said father, you have given us a bad four hours, but it was worth it. Yes, it was worth it, for now we have John's word that there will be peace. But father, what about our own men? They meant it to kill the Indians. I heard them. Those men are cowards at heart, Caddy. Their plans reached my ears when I got home, and I made short work of such notions. Well, well, you are shivering, my dear. We must get you home to a fire. I don't know what your mother will have to say to you, Caddy. But when they reached the farmhouse, the excitement of Caddy's return was overshadowed by another occurrence. Katie, who had sat pale and silent in a corner all during the search, rushed out of the house at the sound of Caddy's return. Caddy, she cried, Caddy! Then suddenly she crumbled like a wilted flower flower and had to be carried away to bed. In the excitement of fetching smelling salts and, wa with, and water, Mrs. Woodman had only time to cry, Caddy, my dear, you ought to be spanked, but I haven't time to do it now. There's a bowl of hot soup for you on the back of the stove. In the kitchen, Tom, Warren, Hetty, and Maggie, and Silas, all the children, crowded around Caddy as she ate, gazing at her in silent admiration, as at a stranger from a far country. Golly, Caddy, they didn't try to scalp you? Did they have on their war paint? Did they wave their tomahawks at you? Caddy shook her head and smiled. She was so warm, so happy to be at home, so sleepy.